just at just a couple minutes past the hour. We're still waiting for a few people to uh, log in. Hello everyone, let's get started. This webinar is Making the Case for School Wellness and it's brought to you by Action for Healthy Kids. Uh, my name is Carol Muller and I am the Regional Field Manager for Colorado and uh, we work on a lot of parent engagement initiatives here in Colorado and um, we're really thrilled to uh, bring this webinar to you and give you some tips and strategies on how you can make a difference in your uh, school community from a parent perspective. Uh, also presenting with us today is Leslie Lewis. She is our state coordinator from Louisiana. Uh, Leslie's a dietitian and she has worked on childhood obesity issues for over 10 years. She's also the parent of three kids and her eldest uh, is just in first grade this year so she's just starting her own journey as a uh, parent in school. And we also have uh, joining us a little bit later in the webinar is Deirdre Sullivan. She's a health educator and parent advocate uh, in the Poudre School District in northern Colorado and has been uh, working in uh, the field for about six years. Uh, and behind the scenes, we have uh, Hannah Laughlin. She is our Illinois State Coordinator, and she's going to be helping us with the technology and uh, answering any questions that you type into your box. So. Um, Let's first of all go over the logistics for the webinar. For those of you that may not be familiar with GoToWebinar, which is our service, uh, first of all, uh, once you're linked in, you should see a control panel. It's usually on the right side of your screen, and you can use either your telephone or your speakers to listen to the presentation, but everybody will be muted to avoid static and background interference. And uh, things like paper shuffling and dogs barking uh, best if everybody can't hear those and it doesn't provide uh, feedback. Uh, there's also a dialog box at the bottom of your control panel. Uh, you can uh, type in questions as you go along and we'll try to get them answered either during the presentation, Hannah will take a look at them, or later in the presentation there'll be time uh, and she'll field some of those to uh, Leslie and Deirdre and myself. And if for any reason we don't get them answered, we can also shoot you an email later. So this webinar is being recorded, and links to the recording and the handouts will be sent to you two to three days after the webinar. So without further ado, let's get started. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Action for Healthy Kids, we are a national nonprofit. We fight childhood obesity, undernourishment, and physical inactivity by helping schools become healthier places. We are made up of moms and dads and teachers and students lots of school and community leaders and school wellness experts, and we've all banded together to create healthier learning environments for our kids. We really feel that everyone has a role to play in ending the nation's childhood obesity epidemic, and we have lots of great programs, tools, and resources that help to make that possible. So uh, we were founded in 2002 by former Surgeon General Dr. David Thatcher, and today we have over 50,000 members. 
We also partner with dozens of professional associations, government agencies, and corporations, both at the, the national, state, and the local level. Now, this presentation is part of the Action for Healthy Kids Parent Leadership Series. Uh, we really feel that parents play a crucial role in creating healthy school communities. And we found that school communities that include strong parent advocates are usually a lot more effective at creating changes which are sustainable and permanent. And so we've developed this series to provide parents and school wellness advocates with the tools and knowledge that they need to make their efforts a success. And on your screen, you can see the topics that are covered in the series. Uh, we divided them into six separate webinars, which we'll present live throughout the year. And we'll always have the latest ones archived for you to view later. So today's presentation is the first in the series, and it's focused on making the case for school wellness. And today we're going to cover why it's important to make the case to your community before you get started. Uh, we're going to talk about how to share information about the childhood obesity crisis and the learning connection. Uh, we're going to go over some common school customs and how they can send conflicting messages. And then again, we're going to talk about sharing best practices, what to share and how to share them. And finally, uh, we'll pull in uh, Deirdre, our parent expert, and uh, give you some answers to common questions and concerns that may come up and that we've uh, found uh, throughout our experience over the past 10 years. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Leslie, and she's going to start to talk about why it's important to make the case. Leslie. Well, thanks, Carol. Thanks so much for having me on. Um, so like Carol mentioned, um, really the, the first step in making the case for school wellness um, in your communities is really to know why it's, it's even important. Why is it necessary to make the, the case for, for school wellness? Knowing the why is really important before you work more towards the what or the how. So um, have you ever, as yourself, as a you know, community leader, health advocate, um, have you heard a parent or a teacher or even a principal say something like, schools are not the time to teach kids about healthy habits? You know, we're here to teach kids about reading, writing, and math. So if, it's, if you hear something like that, it's really your role to convince them why health should be an essential part of every school. Um, and here are just a few reasons why. So as we all know, um, schools reach most children and adolescents in the community. The majority of our children are in a school environment. Um, schools also provide opportunities to practice healthy behaviors. So kids spend around 900 um, hours per year in a school. So it's really a great time to, um, to instill some great healthy um, behaviors. Um, uh, students look to their teachers, their administrators, and their school staff as role models, um, and in addition to the, the parent volunteers that you see in the schools as well. Um, school policies, programs, and practices reinforce the behaviors that our children are learning. So it's really important that they be, um, you know, as healthy as possible. And in addition, curriculum standards for health usually include nutrition and physical, um, physical education. So if that's the case, our practices and climate reflect those standards rather than conflict with them. So really, I mean, the bottom line is that schools show kids what we value and what is important in our community. Um, in fact, schools often have a much higher bar than some families when it comes to things like behavior, conduct, and respect. So why should health be any different? Um, so over the next few minutes, we'll show you some examples of how easy it is for school communities to really send some conflicting messages about, um, about what they value in terms of health. Um, before we do that, let's take a look at um, you know, the obesity crisis in America. Look at this quote from uh, the two former chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Chiefs of Staff. They say, being overweight or obese has become the leading medical reason recruits are rejected for military service. So I think we can all agree that most people know that the U.S. is really suffering from an obesity crisis. But do, we, do they really know how serious it is? And do they know how it relates to them on a personal level? Do they know how it affects their school environment or even their home environment? They really might not understand, you know, all of the different ways that they, may, that they themselves may be contributing to it or the different ways that they can also help solve it. So really, as wellness advocates, it's our job to make these connections for them, to really create a sense of urgency about this national crisis. So a really great um, visual and striking tool is a series of slides from the Center of Disease Control 
um, that shows the increase in obesity in the United States since 1985. The states on the map um, will change color as their obesity rates incre increase. Um, so we're just going to click through the slides and just note that when um, we see a brand new color, it means that there's a higher percentage range um, that has been added to that, to that state um, to accommodate the growing data. And there you have it. So I always find that such to be a, such a striking example. You can see there is not one blue state left. Um, if you were watching, Colorado held out for a very long time, um, but it's actually now the second fastest growing childhood obesity rate in the nation. Um, Colorado's children went from fourth leanest to 23rd leanest in just under three years. I know that sounds you know, really grim, um, but there is a little bit of good news that we recently found out through the Robert Wood Johnson um, Foundation and Trust for America's Health. Um, their report, F7 Fat, that comes out annually. Um, the 2013 report, um, report reported recently that after three decades of increase, um, adult obesity rates remained level in almost every state. Um, however, even though they remain level, the levels really are still very high, as you can see on the slide. So we really need to um, take this opportunity to educate parents and school staff about the negative impacts of unhealthy school practices, inadequate school wellness policies, and the consequences of inaction. Not only will this give you the buy-in and support you need to move your initiatives forward, it will also give you really the confidence to speak up about it. Concern for their children's future can really prod parents and others into action. So it's really a good idea to have several statistics ready to share, uh, and, and you want to share those in a, in a compelling way, but, but also in a sensitive way. You don't want to overwhelm people with too much data. You want to stick to the most memorable and striking facts and ones that are really easily understandable. Uh, here's a couple examples on the slide. Close to one-third of our kids are overweight or obese. Uh, or here's a, a great uh, visual that people can really relate to, that our kids spend an average of, of more than seven hours in front of the TV or computer every day for non-school purposes. And if you have local statistics from your state or school or district, like the ones we just shared from Colorado, that's even better. That can even have a bigger impact. Uh, the CDC and uh, the Data Resource Center which you see on your slide, are, um, are great resources or sources for childhood obesity data, as well as our website at Action for Healthy Kids. And uh, we are going to send out all of the, the links and the resources that you see throughout the presentation. They will be included in uh, the follow-up email, so you don't have to try to write them down now unless you don't want to wait till that follow-up email comes out and you want to get to it right away. So along with obesity information, uh, you'll want to create uh, really a sense of urgency by making the connection between health and academic achievement. And this is really, really important. Uh, let others know that increased physical activity and improved nutrition have been shown in study after study to increase student achievement. Uh, they've shown that undernourished children tend to have low energy, they're often irritable, and they have difficulty concentrating. Uh, they also score low on vocabulary, reading, and arithmetic tests. Uh, this study, uh, which was in the Journal of School Health, shows that it's not just whether you eat, it's also about what you eat. And this study found a significant association between the quality of diet and school performance. Uh, this is uh, really important. How many kids eat a healthy breakfast before school starts? You know, many kids don't eat breakfast at all. And uh, teachers and staff can really relate to this, because if kids are hungry, they're not going into their classes ready to learn. There's a growing body of research showing that skipping breakfast hurts kids' overall cognitive performance. And students who eat school brec breakfast have been shown, on average, to attend one and a half more days of school per year and score 17.5% higher on standardized math tests. So in addition to you know, great nutrition, um, increased physical activity is also related to school performance. So kids who get regular physical activity experience improvements in their fitness levels and their brain function. 
Um, and you can see on this next slide, um, when kids move more, they are better positioned to succeed in the classroom. So studies like the one listed here um, show that increased physical activity helps lead um, to improved math, reading, and writing test scores, just like it showed with the, um, the healthy breakfast. Um, overweight kids, in addition, miss school four times as much as normal weight kids due to things like illness and social, social concerns, um, things like bullying and um, things like that. Um, teachers, office staff, and school nurses can certainly relate to this as well. Um, and of course, if kids aren't in school, they're not equipped to learn. So the learning connection is a really great resource from Action to All the Kids that you can use to share the connection between physical activity, healthy eating, and learning. Um, it's really a great, easy to read, special report that summarizes the most recent research um, proving that healthy kids really are better learners. Uh, many of the facts that we're sharing on today's webinar are from this report. And again, Carol mentioned that we'll, we'll be sending all of the links um, and slides to you later so you can um, see, download that report from the link that was on that slide. Um, okay. So, I'm sorry, go ahead, Carol. Okay. So, sorry. That's, that's okay. And if you want to add anything else, go for it. No, no, that's okay. So um, we also want to point out that just as important as sharing the facts, it's, it's really important to make a link to people's personal lives. Um, you can ask people questions. Do they know anyone who has a chronic disease? Do they know somebody who's always struggling with his or her weight? A lot of the people that get involved with health and wellness in schools do so because they've seen the consequences of living an unhealthy lifestyle play out with somebody in their own family. So when you ask questions like these, you're really encouraging people to put a face on the information that you're providing, and that makes it a lot more meaningful for them. So if you're in an appropriate setting, encourage uh, your audience to share their own stories if they're comfortable doing so. And then when you're talking to school staff, you want to be sure to put the issues into a school context. Uh, how many students visit this nurse's office or miss school because they're sick? You know, how many kids can't run around in PE or at recess because they aren't fit? And as we already mentioned, how many kids don't eat breakfast before school starts? So for all audiences, be sure to connect your message with daily practices taking place in the school environment. Uh, as Leslie mentioned, there are a lot of uh, areas where we send conflicting messages about health and about what we value. And uh, so we're going to go over some examples that you can use when you're making the case. Uh, let's start with rewards. So does your school reward students in a healthy way with certificates, uh, small toys, uh, extra recess time? Or do you use things like fast food coupons, popsicles, candy, and that type of thing? Uh, rewards happen at many levels across the school in the classroom, of course, but also at school-wide events and for PTA-sponsored activities. And uh, experts do recommend non-food rewards as a best practice, and that's something that you can share. Providing food based on performance or behavior really can teach kids to eat when they're not hungry, and that is definitely a big factor in our growing obesity epidemic. So let's take a look at this example. Uh, fitness winners are rewarded with a donut party. So what kind of message are these young athletes receiving? And then this is one of my favorite quotes. This is from Marlene Schwartz at Yale's Rudd Center for Food Policy and Obesity. Uh, she says, rewarding children with unhealthy food in school is like teaching them a lesson on the importance of not smoking and then handing out ashtrays and lighters to the kids who did the best job listening. I think that's a great analogy. But it's just a mint. Uh, come on. So I'm, I've heard this uh, many times. I'm sure we all have. And, and in fact, I know I've probably even said it a few times. Uh, when you hear a comment like that, it's a great opportunity to use a visual aid. Show your audience what happens when a child receives just one mint per day from a teacher, a friend, or another adult. Over the course of the school year, that adds up to over three cups of additional sugar and 3,600 extra calories. So, you know, hold up a mint in a bag with three cups of sugar in it while you point out that it's never just one mint per day. Kids get candy everywhere they go these days, and, and we just love giving them treats. But we just don't understand how quickly it adds up and how our mint turns into ten mints over the course of the day. And the bag of sugar can help to demonstrate that point. So let's talk about celebrations. 
in class, students learn about nutrition and healthy eating, and they, they also hopefully are learning about the importance of moderation. But then in some classrooms, students eat birthday treats over 25 times a year in addition to their holiday parties. And so there was a recent study published in the Journal of Nutrition, Education, and Behavior that revealed that kids can eat as many as one-third of all the calories they need in a day at a typical half-hour birthday party. So in addition to um, you know, kids get, getting these mixed messages in the classroom, they also get it through um, the, VTA, the VTA and the PTAs. So look at this example of um, a message about what's important um, and how it can really be um, confusing. Here you can see that there's a healthy fun run, but then it's followed by a fundraiser at a fast food restaurant. And look at the prize for TV um, turnoff week. It's a high calorie pancake party or something you know similar to that. So parent groups really play a large role in choosing and running the fundraisers, which support music, sports technology, and the art. So we can really use it to our advantage to choose um, you know, the really healthier, the healthier options. Um, so really think about, in your schools, what they promote. Um, again, look at these examples, and you can see um, you know, there's some healthy options, and there's some other unhealthy options. You can either go with a restaurant night promoting fast food, sales of cookie dough, or candy bars. Um, or you can do a healthier option, things like food sales, um, seed packets, start a new garden, um, you can do an active fundraiser, um, like a bike-a-thon. And those are definitely better aligned with what we're um, you know, trying to teach our kids about health. But in addition, um, we also have to think about our family events, um, things that we you know, promote in school, um, things like the school carnival, the donuts with dads, the muffins with moms. All of these things, you know, are continuously occurring in the school, and as Carol mentioned, you know, all of that starts to add up. So we've talked a lot about nutrition, um, but what about physical activity? We mentioned it a little bit, um, but again, in class, students tend to learn that physical activity is really critical to lead a long and healthy life. However, in most schools, recess time is really shrinking. Um, you know, schools are cutting, either cutting recess out or um, uh, decreasing the amount of time for recess to really make room for more academics and for students to make up homework and tests. Um, recesses are often taken away for disciplinary pur purposes when kids act up. And often, it's the kids that are acting up like that who really just can't sit still in class and who need that extra recess time. Now less than 10% of public schools actually offer daily PE. Um, of course, it used to be in everyday um, schools having PE. And now, again, it's less than 10% of public schools offering daily PE. So your role in all of this as a wellness advocate is really just to point out the contrast to your audience. Um, you know, We're not looking to lay blame on everyone or any particular person, um, but we just really need to show just how confusing all, the, all these messages are for our children. How will children really know what we value when we say one thing and yet promote another? Um, so when your audience sees these conflicting messages, they will be more likely to see their part in both the problem and the solution. So let's talk about the solution. And I want to emphasize how important it is to focus much of your discussion around solutions. Being negative or confrontational, laying blame, like Leslie mentioned, that's not going to get you nearly as far as asking for your audience's help and offering them a way to be part of the solution. And uh, sharing best practices is a great way to present your solutions to people. You want to tell your audience about what's happening with school wellness policies and practices in your own district, and you want to share best practices from other districts so that they can place your initiatives and your concerns and efforts in the proper context. You know, uh, you can talk about what is your district working on in terms of health? Have there been healthy changes to the lunch menus, or are there changes in the works? Is the wellness policy being used, and has it been updated recently? Is there a district wellness committee or a health advisory council that meets regularly and takes action? And, and is that committee making their efforts public uh, to help promote the work? Uh, that's a requirement of the Healthy Hunger-Free Kids Act. So, 
um, it's important that your committee uh, is doing that. Uh, and then um, what are the healthiest schools doing in terms of nutrition and physical activity? Let's take a few minutes to go over the recommended best practices that you can share. Uh, first off, you want to make healthy options standard whenever foods are shared. Parties, fundraisers, school events, celebrations, uh, that's in and out of the classroom. And this can also include snack time in school stores, vending machines, athletic events. Uh, there's a great picture of a healthy Halloween party there at Ryan Elementary in uh, Westminster, Colorado. And then uh, choose fresh fruits and vegetables, whole grains and low-fat, fat-free dairy products whenever possible. Uh, how about a watermelon social instead of an ice cream social? Or how about a yogurt and fruit bar? And water is especially important. Kids need lots of water, and too often sugary drinks are their primary source. Now, food doesn't have to be the primary focus or even included in every event. Uh, you can host active events, uh, like Leslie mentioned, uh, that promote physical activity along with music, art, and games. Uh, we love this idea. This is the uh, picture on the slide is an active fundraiser. It's a hippity hop a uh, from an elementary school in Ohio. And uh, the great thing about this, the kids um, hopped during the event, and then each one took home one of the hippity hop balls and continued hopping uh, when they got home, and the school also raised a lot of money. So um, back to rewards. Uh, whether you're a teacher, a parent, or an administrator, you want to provide students with non-food rewards for good behavior and performance, and a special privileges and trinkets uh, both fit the bill with this. Another avenue that you can um, work with is your school nutrition department. You know, look at the menus that they're serving, or look at the meals that they're serving. You can help support them in the new healthy meals that are being provided. Um, learn how the school meal programs work. Um, learn what you can do to support the school meal improvements and be a resource to the food service staff. I think everyone would agree that you know they are very busy and have to follow some, you know, federal guidelines to so really show them that they're here to to work with them and to make their job easier. I think everyone agrees that we're all in it for, you know, for the kids. So you can also look for um, increased opportunities for nutrition education. You can supplement what is being taught in the classroom through things like the school gardens, a healthy snack program. You can do things like taste tests, um, of course, healthy vendings, and also look at your school stores. Um, how about offering healthy tips to um, your, in putting health tips in your school newsletter, or bringing in special workshops for both the students and the families. You can also look to ways to help increase physical activity throughout the school day and beyond. So think about classroom activity breaks. Think about more or better recess. Look at your before and after school programs. Um, you know, think outside the box. What about a walk to school or a bike to school program? Important um, to build support for these healthy practices and ensure that they will continue. You want to urge your school leaders to write them into school policies, into school, into school guidelines. It's really a shame if we put forth through all of this work and it doesn't get incorporated into school policies and guidelines, and then as you know, things turn over or things get shuffled around, um, all of the work that you did um, ends up you know, going to the wayside. So it's really important to incorporate them into the school improvement goals so that you're able to stay on track and keep attention focused on health as the priority. So again, I mean, a great way to share best practices is by using success stories. You really want to look out into your community and just find out what types of programs and initiatives have been successful in your area. You know, look for relevant local success stories. Everyone at a school is going to relate more to what's going on in their surrounding neighborhoods than they would to what's going on in another state. Um, and the school knows that another school has been successful, it might be easier to get them on board. Um, of course, you know, there's always healthy competition between schools and between districts, so use that to your advantage. Um, if you're making the case to parents, share successful parent-led or PTA initiatives that happened at other schools. If you're making the case to teachers and administrators, share success stories that happened with other teachers or administrators that they've implemented. Remember, you really just want to point out the impacts and the terms that will resonate with that particular audience. So, for example, if you know XYZ school across town started a breakfast in the classroom program, and as a result, students are more focused, attendance has increased, parties have decreased, and visits to the nurse's office have declined, you certainly want to point that out to you know the school administrators, the school staff, 
because that's definitely something that would get their attention. So here's another great example um, that you can use from our website. Um, this is Far Elementary in Ocala, Florida, um, where they implemented the game on uh, the Ultimate Wellness Challenge, which is Action for Healthy Kids free wellness program for elementary schools. Um, they had a lot of different activities, and at one point they did um, a vegetable test with their fourth grade students. And teachers were absolutely amazed at the results. So after the taste test, the students unanimously chose to have vegetables rather than cookies, candy, chips at their holiday party, which is you know, pretty incredible. It's also great to include the kids in as much as possible because having them on board, of course, is going to go a long way as well. And in addition to changing their attitudes and preferences about, about food, the school also experienced dramatic increases in this, um, the students' test scores after promoting healthy eating and physical activity. And again, as I, um, I mentioned before, the Learning Connection has some great success stories that you can use. And there's also um, many stories that you can pull from our website. Thanks, Leslie. So uh, now, um, after everything that we've talked about, um, you've made your case. And ideally, everybody at your school is in perfect agreement. Uh, at least we would love that to be the case. But um, most likely, there will be questions and there will be concerns about what you want to do. So we put together a list of common questions and concerns that we've heard from many parents and school leaders over the years. And that's why we invited a Deirdre Sullivan, our parent expert, to weigh in. So uh, Deirdre worked in the Poudre School District as a health educator for uh, University of Colorado Health and CANDU, which is an obesity prevention organization, for uh, six years. She's worked with parents and schools, and she's achieved success uh, both at the school level with healthy fundraisers, before and after school programs, and uh, extra PE activities. Uh, and she's also achieved a great success um, with larger district changes, uh, health initiatives um, being added to school board policy, reforming school meal programs, and in including, uh, and this is really a big one, including health and PE on the mill levy. So we are thrilled to have Deirdre here today and excited to hear her responses to some of these uh, common questions. So welcome, Deirdre. Thank you. So here's our first one. Uh, I know we've all heard this and probably said it, too. We're just too busy. How are we going to fit these wellness projects in? That is a common one. So school leaders probably agree that wellness is important, but a lot of times we do hear that they don't have the time, the energy, or the resources to commit to it. Their teachers are overwhelmed. Um, this is just one more thing added to a long list. So I think it's important to reassure them that there's parent support um, and that you can start small. Uh, a lot of the wellness-related activities, programs, policy changes, et cetera, can, you know, they're incremental and they don't really take much time at all. And I think even being willing to throw out some examples um, in the get-go or right out of the starting gates, like um, you know something as simple as, hey, why don't we try a school-wide effort to do an extra recess as an alternative option to birthday cupcakes uh, for, for kids. And that addresses food allergies and um, parents' health concerns. And it doesn't cost us anything or really take up any more time than what we're already doing. All right, here's another one. Shouldn't we be focusing on academics? <laughs> That's a very common question. And I think going back to the presentation, while we are all concerned and care about childhood obesity, it's important to remember that our schools see themselves as really being charged to address academics. And if we can help make that connection, um, I, I think you know probably tw for every statement of, of doubt um, on behalf of a school person, we need to make 20 statements linking health to academic achievement. And in our own community, we really narrowed it down and came up with a very simple slogan that healthy students learn better. And that's really what it's about. Because um, you know it's not uncommon to hear a principal or a school board member or a superintendent say, you know, you're among a long line of people coming in and talking to me about you know, drug abuse and child abuse and parents in jail. And now it's childhood obesity. And I think the more we can relay it back to what they are really caring about and charged to do, um, the better uh, off we'll be. 
Um, I think it's also important to point out that wellness activities don't take away from academics, um, that there's a lot of um, physical activity, nutrition education, et cetera, that can be integrated into existing classroom lessons, and even providing some resources and tools about how you do math with academics, you know, active academics, um, writing exercises that involve involved nutrition, et cetera. Um, there's a great example from Gunnison, Colorado on the screen. They won a state-level Healthy School Champion Award in 2012, describing their program as a high-functioning, best practices-driven, creative, effective, and fun-coordinated school health program. As you can see from the quote on the slide, they believe that um, increases in test scores and attendance have a strong connection to their wellness program. So I think um, kind of also going back to some content in the webinar, it's important to share some data. There's some great data out of Texas and Naperville, Indiana, um, or sorry, uh, Illinois, around um, student achievement and health. But it's also important to integrate some stories um, and really make that personal connection. That you know, in our neighboring district, they started noticing that kids were paying better attention when they started a universal breakfast program in the classroom, or just some anecdotes to complement the data, because sometimes we can come across as being too data-driven and, um, you know, focused on those things. That's all great, Deirdre. Uh, here's another one. It's not the school's job to teach healthy habits. Isn't that the parent's job? <laughs> Yes, these are all common questions. Um, I think it's important to remind the school that it's their job to maximize student performance. So going back to that whole link between health and academic achievement. You know, and I think if you ever watch somebody who's really media savvy, they always have their, their bridge and pivot, that thing they come back to no matter what arguments are thrown at them that by the news reporter. And if I had to say, you know, like in our town, that bridge and pivot and that, that statement that we just drill into our heads is healthy students learn better. So all of these questions that, you know, that were asked, we really can keep go going back to that very simple statement of health and academics are interrelated. Um, you know, nobody's asking for or expect the schools to solve the childhood obesity epidemic, but we also can't. It's so complex that none of us can do it alone. So yes, I as a parent can make healthier choices for my family at the grocery store. Um, I can't, I as a teacher can stop giving away food um, as a reward in my classroom. I as a principal can implement a policy in my school. I think that levels of the spheres and levels of influence goes all the way out and it's, we're going to need every single one of those spheres to, to combat this. Um, I'm, I remember writing a letter to my daughter's fifth grade teacher after she had gotten 60 suckers and 60 days of school for every time she answered a question correctly and then a pizza party and a root beer float party. And I use the statement of, I'm your partner in education. I enforce homework practices. I get my kids to bed on time. I feed them a healthy breakfast so that they can be learners in your classroom. And I just need you to be my partner in health. Like, if you look at it as a partnership rather than a, we have to have one or the other, um, I think that also can be helpful. So. Okay, have you heard this one? We don't want to break with our school's traditions. Uh, you know, we've always had an ice cream social to reward our star, star athletes, or we've always had that cookie dough fundraiser for the past 20 years, and it's our biggest money maker. Yes, traditions. I think it's important to ask whether our school traditions are having a negative impact on our academic performance and health, and whether we're teaching kids, you know, unhealthy habits and maybe creating some new traditions. You know. Ice cream parties 20 years ago were probably done in a time where the kids were walking and biking to school, where they had physical education every day, where um, they weren't bombarded with every single possible media temptation under the planet and spending the seven hours a day of screen time. So there's a lot of factors that come into play. And I think um, if we take that 40,000 foot view and say it's not just about the food, it's also about the opportunities to burn those calories, um, that it's it's a good time to reevaluate um, those traditions and whether they're part of the problem or part of the solution. But that is really common to hear, you know, well, we've always done it this way. And I think um, that's an important um, thing to be ready to hear and to say, well, you know, there's a lot of things that we've always done a certain way. And there's also a lot of opportunities to look at whether that's still in the best interests of kids and what our role are as adults are in, in shape, changing that. 
Okay, and I hear this one a lot. The kids like what we, we're serving them now, and we don't want that to change. <laughs> I um, love to quote Ann Cooper, the renegade lunch lady who lives here in our very own Boulder, Colorado, and has been tremendously helpful to our parent advocacy group as we've tried to make some changes to our school nutrition program. She said, well, kids would like a shot of heroin in the arm if that's what we gave them, but does that mean it's the right thing to do? Um, you know, kids like a lot of things that we don't offer them because of the negative consequences. They'd like to ride bikes without helmets. They'd like to stay home from school. You know, they thinking about other policies and regulations around things that aren't healthy for them, tobacco, alcohol. Um, sometimes it's hard to remember that kids are not in charge for a reason. We are. It takes time, patience, and a lot of attempts. Serving the same new food sometimes to change kids' preference, but it's well worth the effort. We had a great example of um, one of our parents' moms was a lunch lady, uh, or one of our, yeah, her mom was a lunch lady in a small rural Colorado town back in the 60s. And she, her mom recounts um, when they introduced the taco and how the kids wouldn't touch it. They, they threw more tacos away in that garbage can, but it just took serving it a few times. And now to think about a kid not liking a taco we're kind of going in the opposite direction now, but um, I just think it's a good analogy of some, how long it takes to make those changes and how um, we need to have, be persistent and be willing to be the adults. And, and what about the second question on the screen? Uh, what if parents are concerned that we're removing foods that are an important part of their heritage and you know they, they feel that somehow that's being critical of their heritage? You know, this is a, it is an important question, and I think um, some, you know, culture change is hard. It takes time and patience. Um, we're not suggesting in any way that heritage should be discarded and, and uh, its traditions in every setting all the time, but we also um, encourage unhealthy foods to be offered on a limited basis, not in the school setting, to really put the power back in the hands of parents and say, you're the one who can determine what moderation looks like for your child. If, if your heritage, it's important for you to serve cupcakes at a birthday party and we're trying to get the school to move away from that, then by all means do that in your home. Um, we had a physician though, and it was really interesting, who was part of our coalition, and he served a very large number of low-income Spanish-speaking families, and we talked about this very issue. And he said, what's, very, what's so interesting is in the Hispanic Latino culture, they really look at physicians and teachers as sources of credible information. And so for him as a physician who was advising patients to have zero sugar sweetened beverages a day or to reduce their sugar and fat intake, he said it was being countered by teachers to whom they also looked at, um, you know, handing out foods. and So I think it's important um, not to make assumptions about what a culture may or may not uh, believe in or want. There was a recent article put out, I believe, by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that among Hispanic Latino parents, the number one priority for them were their ch was their children's health. And so if we can frame it for whatever you know cultural um, issues and beliefs and practices we know, um, if we can frame this discussion around that, um, I think we'll be we'll be better off. Um, and again, putting it back in the hands of parents. Moderation. The whole argument about moderation. Moderation is a, is lost for American children. And really, the only person or entity that can really determine the context for the sugary treat or the indulgence is the parent. So. That's great, Deirdre. Uh, so this final question. This is of course one of the big ones. What about when schools say they can't afford any new initiatives? Uh, their budget barely covers what's needed for academics, much less music and the arts. Uh, where are they supposed to find room for wellness initiatives? That's a great question. Um, we all know budgets are tight in schools, and they don't want any unfunded mandates, so to speak. I think it's important, again, to remember that it takes a lot of time and patience and perseverance, but also um, while some projects take some funding, there's a lot of things we can do that don't cost money at all and in some ways either save money or raise money. Things like, you know, as I mentioned, doing recess instead of the birthday treats. Um, we do a, um, many schools in our school district do have replaced their candy bar sales and their wrapping paper thing sales 
with jogathons and walkathons and zumbathons, and we do rewards for the kids who raise the most money. And what's so interesting is that the kids, time and time again, they pick being principal for a day, being the PE teacher for a day, where they wear a whistle around their neck, or they get to make the morning announcements, or those kind of things that don't cost a penny. Um, you know, there's also um, some opportunities to create funding sources for wellness through these fundraisers. I we started a jogathon at my daughter's school about six, seven years ago, and the PTA earmarked 30% of the proceeds to go towards ongoing wellness initiatives. Because if we were going to do a wellness fundraiser, we felt like we needed to walk the talk and use it to fund wellness programs. The rest of the money, the 70%, went to fund you know field trips and teacher appreciation and things like that. Um, but it was a great way to uh, start a funding source for wellness activities. And um, so I think it's important, kind of going back to that first question of we don't have the time. Um, you know, time and money are very synonymous when it comes to, to these efforts. And so to you know, reinforce the notion that we can start small, we can start free. Um, and then when we want to move to things that cost money, we can do some fundraisers. We can look into grant opportunities. Um, looking at community partners um, to help out. I wanted to redirect um, folks again to the learning connection. It talks a lot about um, how healthier practices at school can actually re increase their bottom line um, and how schools get a financial boost by offering more nutritious meals and snacks. Um, I think the, the one little nugget that I heard from another parent expert um, at a, a conference was that um, it's really important as champions for wellness in schools that we add before we take away. And many of us, myself included, have learned the hard way that if we come in as the cup cr cupcake crusaders trying to rid the school of unhealthy practices like handing out suckers for answering questions right or giving out frost mile high frosting, um, we tend to make more enemies than friends because food is really sensitive. And so if you're brand new to this or if you're you know, thinking about where to get started, my experience has been start with something where you're adding and you're enhancing, such as a before school running club or after school yoga or um, uh, an extra recess as an option instead of the birthday cupcakes. Um, because this is really a continuum of change. And we're, we're talking about a complete and total paradigm shift for people when it comes to unhealthy food and sedentary practices in schools. And so if we can start with those enhancements, then I think we'll find ourselves cultivating other advocates and not feeling alone. And the example that I use is that very same school where I started the Jogathon seven years ago. Um, that's all that I did. I started a wellness fundraiser. It raised $10,000 in its first year. And this was as a school with 60% of students being on free and reduced lunch. And it really started to generate a buzz about health and fitness. And about a year later, when it came time to plan the end of year school carnival, it was another parent on the PTA who said, you know, I think it's time to reevaluate whether we need a cotton candy machine at the carnival. I mean, we are a wellness school with the, the fun run. And I think we should really be looking at things like healthy foods. And, and I just sat there, and it was one of those aha moments of, I didn't bring up the cotton candy. I just started the fun run and, um, and then organically let it um, unfold. And to be quite honest, I think those of us who devote an hour for a webinar or who are really passionate about this issue, we want to see change quickly. And I was in that same boat where I um, wanted to immediately see some school policy change, wanted to see district policy change. And just now, seven years after we started that fitness fundraiser, does the school, just last year, they passed a school-wide um, no treats policy, no food in the classroom. Um, so it just is a process, and it takes a little bit of time. But in the end, I think we, we will see some broad sweeping changes that, that we're all in this for. So sorry, that was a longer answer to that question, Carol. <laughs> No, everything you're saying is fabulous. We really, really appreciate uh, you sharing your experiences and your expertise with us. And thank you so much for joining us. So um, Leslie, I just want to give you the opportunity to, if you have anything to add in your own experience or any thoughts or comments in addition. Yeah, I mean, no. I mean, I think Deidre has said 
has given us some great things to think about and to come back to our schools. Um, it's definitely been, I've learned a lot myself, so um, thank you so much. I guess the one thing I would add is just, um, you know, just think about your audience when, you know, think about who is giving you, um, you know, the most, I don't want to say trouble, but I guess who's the biggest battle with. Um, so say if it's the principal that are really making the arguments and, you know, has a lot of concerns about it, then you might need to take that as a sign that you'll just need to spend some time um, bringing other parents to the cause. You know, I mean, of course, we can get more things um, accomplished with, with numbers. So if you have a, you know, a good amount of parents on your side that are all coming to the principal, you know, with these concerns, he or she may, like, um, be more willing to, um, to listen to you or to, you know, to bend a little bit. Good, great points. Thank you. So I wanted to uh, just add uh, that a final note to remember that should really always be a part of your main message whenever you're making the case is that parents, teachers, students, school leaders, and community members really can make a lasting impact when we combine efforts. And, and the key to providing children with these consistent messages is all about working together, So, which I think we, we that is kind of a theme in, in all of the answers we've given today. But uh, we do have a slideshow presentation that you can download and share with your audience. And it's got a lot of the same slides that are in this webinar, the ones that talk about the obesity crisis and the conflicting messages and the best practices. And uh, you're welcome to download it, take it to your school, share it individually with people or a small group, PTA meeting, uh, whatever. Uh, we challenge you to use it to make the case for school wellness in your school community. And uh, Hannah, it looks like we still have uh, uh, we have a few minutes for questions, so I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, you can let us know if anything has come in. Absolutely. So we did get a question about um, if this if the PowerPoint uh, will be shared after the call, and I just wanted to let everyone know that the recording of the webinar today and the uh, PDF of the PowerPoint will be shared um, in the. Uh, this week with you via email. So do look out for the follow-up email. Then I have a question about um, really engaging school administrators that maybe aren't super supportive and how in particular parents can help kind of translate the need for uh, a focus on health and wellness to support academic achievement to school administrators. And if you guys have any examples of districts around the country that have have really utilized parents as a force for convincing administrators of the importance of health and wellness initiatives. And Deirdre, I think you would might be a good person to field that from your experiences with uh, a parent advocate group that you work with. Sure. Um, the first thing that came to my mind with that question was really around using principals and administrators who are supportive and who do buy this to be your messengers and your spokespeople. Um, Sometimes it may not be wellness that a principal or an administrator is necessarily opposed to. They may just have, you know, kind of a philosophy of holding a parent group at arm at length, at arm's length. And so, no matter what the topic, you might just be dealing with a, a different philosophy. Um, and an example of that, not that, you know, a parent holding parents at an arm's length, but we had a principal in our local school district who was not. Um, supportive of universal breakfast in the classroom, even though their school had, gosh, 90% of students who were eligible for free breakfast, but only less than half were participating in it. Well, we had another principal who was a huge champion for this, who had done it at his school, who had ironed out the wrinkles, figured out how to make it work, addressed all of the staff um, you know, concerns and questions. And so we asked him if we could bring the doubtful principal over to do a tour and to show her um, how it was done and answer her questions. And she went back and said, okay. Um, so I think that that's an important um, notion is that if you do come across administrators or principals who may not be real open and receptive to parent feedback, um, then it is, you know, it's advantageous to find um, their peers who can help talk that talk with you. And I know, Deirdre, I think you've told me before, too, that you also, uh, you alluded to this earlier, that uh, getting, um, you know, medical experts and physicians to 
make the case sometimes uh, can be a little even more effective than parents. Absolutely. I think if everybody thinks about the awkward conversation you've had at a PTA meeting or a, you know, with that parent who launches into you about this is all about moderation and you're trying to take away everything fun in school, and you think about, gosh, if I had a lab coat on and a stethoscope around my neck, and I could tell this mom, I saw three patients today who were children with adult diseases because of their lifestyle choices. Um, I sure have a lot more clout than I do just as a passionate mom. And so that's, I'm glad you brought that up, Carol, because that's very important, whether you're talking to school board members or um, parents, um, to bring in folks who are, are medical professionals and who care about this. And our experience has been that they are more than willing and they want an opportunity to lend their voice. They're frustrated in their clinics trying to deal with patient by patient um, and, and, and these issues. So if given the opportunity, we had a physician speak at every school board meeting in a seven-month time period about the need for increased activity and better food um, at school. And, um, and it was no problem finding physicians to speak. So I think absolutely. And I think the, the other point, the other piece, um, in our experience, we had a superintendent in our school district who did not, he did, was not a fan of health and wellness. Every question that you posed today, Carol, he would throw at us. And so we went to the school board. And um, we actually helped to get three new school board members elected who made public statements about caring about health and wellness. And while that seems big and daunting to some people, if you live in a small community or if you're engaged and um, active in your community, you probably know folks who would run for school board or would help with a campaign. And we know that those top level decision makers can be really important pieces of the puzzle. Yeah, that's a great point with the election coming up. Uh, candidate forums are out there, I know, at least in my school district, and having mm -hmm. some health and wellness questions ready for them to see how they stand can just put the issue in the public eye as well as help you learn about how they stand on things. Exactly. Our parent group even came out and um, endorsed candidates based on their response. Um, so, Hannah, do we have anything else? We do. Um, we have a question about emphasis on data to support school wellness efforts. And kind of what, what is Action for Healthy Kids' perspective on really tracking students' BMI and uh, using this as a tool to raise awareness? That's a good question, and I can answer uh, if you want me to, Carol. Yeah, why don't you go ahead? You are probably more familiar with the the Action for Healthy Kids perspective on it. Okay, so um, although BMI is a great tool for for parents that, to understand kind of their child's health status, it's a something in a school building that takes a lot of energy to get done and a lot of. Uh, confidentiality issues arise from that, and it also can just in general be a controversial topic. Um, it's oftentimes best if you want to do BMI screenings in your school to work with a local out, like local community organization like a hospital that could help you do BMIs. Action for Healthy Kids doesn't measure BMIs in the schools that we fund or we provide direct technical assistance to because it also takes a number of years and numerous um, you know, policy and systems environmental changes and initiatives to ha have that data change. So our focus generally is instead on those programs and initiatives and policy instead of BMI just because of the amount of um, kind of time and energy that it takes. Um, great. Thanks for answering that, Hannah. I know mm -hmm. um, my experience is with parents, I know not everybody, it, it, it can be controversial for sure for the reasons that you said. So. Um, it is uh, something to really research and, and consider if you're going to get involved in it. But it certainly can provide good data, too. So, uh, so yeah. we are at the top of our hour. And um, any questions that we didn't either answer in during the webinar or afterwards, uh, we will uh, take a look at and uh, email you our best effort. And uh, we do want to... Uh, point out that we have a couple, the next webinar in this series, which is How to Work with Schools and Wellness Policies 101 is coming up. 
uh, on a Tuesday, October 1st at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. So if you haven't registered for that, uh, you can do so on our website. And uh, if you want to learn more about Action for Healthy Kids and how you can get involved with our mission and our movement, we'd really encourage you to take our Every Kid Healthy Pledge on our website and help us create a 100,000-person movement to make all schools healthier places. Uh, once you've signed up, we'll show you lots of ways, big and small, that you can turn your commitment into action. And um, thanks so much for joining us today. It's uh, been a pleasure, and hope you have a great day.